Hi, this is Jayanth here and uh, today I'm going to focus on CPU related issues with regard to SQL Server. Now, most of the time I tell people on my trainings that uh, the CPU is the most fastest component in SQL Server and not usually a reason for bottlenecks, but uh, over the couple of uh, years that I've been doing this, I've noticed that CPU is becoming more of a constraint mainly because people are doing a lot more stuff with their data. Uh, Often what you see is that BI systems as well as uh, old TV systems kind of get merged and a lot of massive group by statements and things like that run on the same system. And the expectation is that, you know, we have real time data requirements or analysis requirements. As a result, we can't really go ahead and do some kind of ETL process. So uh, keeping all these things in mind, we're seeing more and more people using their CPU more intensively. And as a result, uh, developers need to start focusing more in terms of how their query impacts CPU. Earlier, what we do is, you know, we focus on locking and blocking behavior. We focus on deadlocks. We focus on memory utilization, even to some extent. But very rarely do we actually focus on the C CPU aspects. So uh, today what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to simulate a CPU issue. So you'll see here I've got a database. Now essentially this is a test database that I've created for my trainings. And essentially what I have here is I've got a hospital kind of scenario uh, represented here where I've got doctors and I've got patients and doctors are related to patient via the episode or the consultation. Every consultation has a billing and as part of the consultation the doctor diagnoses you with a particular disease. And and then provides you treatment for it. Obviously, we've got a couple of other things going on as well, but uh, this is the core of what we're doing today. Now, the first thing that we want in our doctor patient hospital billing system is to be able to identify the patient and identify uh, the kind of incidents that have happened. So, a sort of patient history, if you will, in terms of when this patient has come before and what kind of illnesses the patient typically has. So, you know, usually certain people have recurring instances of the same. Uh, diagnosis so we're trying to capture that kind of patient history here now you'll see that uh, in this particular scenario I'm not using a stored procedure mainly so I can just go ahead and do it uh, uh, as a batch here and you'll see that I'm picking up a random patient so you will see it's top one email ID and then I search for that email ID in the patient records episodes mapping for diagnostics and then fetch the diagnostic details so the output is going to look something like this Right, so I get to know the name of the patient, the year and month when they came in, the unique identifier for the episode, and the diseases that were identified as part of that particular episode. So the idea here is that obviously it's not very realistic in terms of the data itself, but uh, we've got millions of rows in this table. And uh, I'll go ahead and just quickly run this query right now to kind of give you an idea about what's going on. Before we do that, I'll just... Uh, just a second let me just go ahead and uh, show you the execution plan so you'll see that I don't have any indexes at the moment I've just got my very straightforward query which is doing nested loop joins between all the tables to give me the final output and uh, naturally that's not how any real-time query looks like but I wanted to take it from scratch to show you how you would proceed so uh, the first thing I need to do is obviously go ahead and do a baseline so I'm gonna go ahead and run this along with the same query again in another window in another session and uh, again multiple uh, instances of the same query and the reason I'm doing this is to kind of show you how by just running this pretty massive query again and again on different instances my CPU spikes to about a hundred percent and consistently remains there until all the query execution is completed more importantly you'll see that uh, the execution over here once you look at it you can see that it takes about 398 milliseconds and you'll see that the CPU time is uh, pretty high because obviously all my CPU times are being added up to show that it's 889 milliseconds total CPU usage against a total execution time of about 344 milliseconds. And you'll see that this kind of keeps increasing as more and more stress is being put on the CPU you'll see that it's jumping to about a second now, a second and a half. So you'll see that uh, it's only making things worse. and the way to identify that to see whether you're actually having CPU issues is to go ahead and run a query to identify that. So if you look here, if I go ahead and just clear off my uh, wait stats at the moment and then go ahead and do select star from sysdmos wait stats to find out which is the common wait type that uh, impacts my queries. Uh, you'll see that naturally I've got CX packets which is for parallelism because you'll notice that my execution plan also had parallelism. So let me stop this because uh, it's kind of interfering with the, the total CPU that I have which was kind of expected 
and since I've got the screen capture going on the two of them together are slowing things down right so the proof is here basically in the uh, weight stats where you can see that the two major weight types that I'm encountering here are OS scheduler yield as well as uh, CX packets now OS scheduler yield is where the uh, the the threads basically surrender themselves to others so that uh, surrender the scheduler or the CPU to other threads so that uh, while I'm waiting someone else can go ahead and do their job and that's often a side effect of parallelism where you'll see that uh, parallelism is usually impacted by the uh, the slowest processor and one way to identify that is if you look here you can go ahead and run this query which is basically to do by scheduler the current task count so you'll see that if I just execute one query here you'll see that the task count on on the different CPUs keep fluctuating so you'll see that it's mostly in the double digit digits and that's not usually a good thing right so uh, the CPU is usually so fast that it's able to handle tasks very frequently very fast and doesn't usually get to a point where it's double digits now uh, the thing to keep in mind here is that naturally at this point I know I have performance issues and I want to identify which is the query that's causing the performance issue so what I'm doing here is I'm going ahead and sorting by uh, the total worker time column inside the sysdmx query stats uh, DMV and when I do that essentially what it's going to do is it's going to show me the queries that consume the maximum amount of CPU now in this particular case you'll see that uh, when I sort it by uh, uh, total worker time these two or even these three are kind of the most massive executions that I have at the moment and you'll also see that they've been executed a very large number of times so what I typically try to do is I try to identify CPU intensive queries by dividing the total worker time by the execution count to kind of see if uh, if a query is executed uh, a million times and it has a total worker time of one million then I wouldn't really consider that to be bad so uh, there is some calculation that needs to go in mind essentially the very simple rule would be to divide this by this and that will give you an idea about uh, executions that are uh, pretty massive now if I scroll to the end you'll see that I've got the execution plan here and uh, when I open up the execution plan you'll see that it's my uh, query that I've written here so it's uh, basically as expected the query that I'm having the issue with so uh, let's go ahead and find out what we can do to tune this yeah. Now, naturally, the first thing I want to do is I want to put indexes because, as you can see, there's a huge amount of table scans happening there, and uh, the table scans are a bad thing. So, the first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and add an index on my patient table because, essentially, I'm only looking for information regarding to one patient. And that patient email ID is essentially what I really want to filter by first. So, keeping that in mind, let me go ahead and right click indexes, new index. And I'm going to use a non clustered index here because I'm only really interested in the patient name and the patient ID. But I first want to look up the email ID. So, once I look up the email ID, I need to output the patient ID so I can join with episodes table and then the patient name. So, I'll go ahead and include those two in the index but only in the leaf node. Once that's done, I've got the patient ID and that patient ID needs to be looked up against the episode table. So the next index I'm going to create is the non-clustered index on the episode table. Now again the reason I'm creating the uh, non-clustered index is because if you look at uh, the list of columns here you'll see that I'm only really interested in these two columns or these three columns because I've got like start date over here as well. So ideally I want to look up the patient ID first and then corresponding to that patient ID look up the uh, uh, episode ID and start name um, start date sorry right, so uh, I want to include uh, over here the episode ID as well as the start date so I'm gonna go ahead and select those two and again uh, the tables are gonna get pretty massive towards the end so once I've identified the episode the next thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and take that episode ID and look up the corresponding information regarding the diagnostic codes associated with this episode so again I'm gonna go ahead use indexes non clustered index and again this time even though I have a fairly narrow table I've still got two additional columns that I'm not really interested in and m over and about that uh, again you'll notice here that the clustered index would probably be needed to create on the diagnostic uh, session ID so I'm going to go ahead and use episode ID here as the lookup key column and I'm going to include the diagnostic uh, di diagnostic ID or the diag ID over here as the included column. 
So the reason I'm doing it like this by using just the non-clustered indexes is because the non-clustered index will only contain the two columns that you're interested in, whereas a clustered index is essentially the entire table itself. So the wider the table, as in the more columns that you have in the table, the more reads happen against that particular index. And that in, in itself can consume more RAM, can even go ahead and uh, increase the amount of CPU that you end up using. So uh, having done this, the next thing I want to do is, or the last thing I want to do is, put in an index on the diagnostic codes so that I can look up the diagnostic IDs quicker. And you'll see here that while this particular table has only a, a fairly uh, small number of columns, the width of the columns are pretty huge. And here I'm only looking for the diagnostic description. So I don't want this 512 kilobytes being searched on uh, on this query execution. So again, I'm going to go ahead and create a non-clustered index where the diagnostic ID or the diag ID is the uh, the key column and the included column is going to be the diagnostic description. So now that I've got this, let's see what kind of uh, impact it has on the execution plan. So you'll notice earlier when I did this, I had an execution plan that was uh, very significant in terms of parallelism and uh, I think I have it somewhere here. So let me see if I can uh, well, actually, I don't. So, uh, earlier, if you had noticed or if you remember, you'd have seen that I had a fairly ex uh, massive parallel execution going on, which is why CX packets and everything else was pretty high. So, once I go ahead and look at this execution plan now, you'll notice that I no longer have any parallelism tasks going on, and I don't have any table scans going on either. Now, the first one is obviously to just fetch the random patient ID over here. So you'll see that there's a sort operator here as well corresponding to the order by new ID. And uh, after that you'll see that I'm actually doing only nested loop joins between all the other tables. And this is going to be important for us because uh, I want to go ahead and reduce the execution time of the queries. right? So I want to go ahead and reduce the CPU utilization at the same time make sure that it doesn't result in the query taking longer to execute. So that's why I've created all these indexes. Now to kind of evaluate the performance there you'll notice that earlier it was going up to a minute, min uh, not a minute, a second, a second of uh, 50, uh, 500 milliseconds. So let's see what uh, happens now. So you'll see that when I execute the query uh, Execution is again a lot better than before. More importantly, it's only 124 milliseconds compared to uh, almost a second previously. And the CPU time, if you notice here, it's no longer in the hundreds but in the low tens or low twenties actually. So, this is essentially what I'm trying to do here. By creating the right kind of indexes, I've kind of allowed SQL Server to fetch the data faster. And because it's able to fetch the data faster, it doesn't need as many CPU use, uh, resources anymore. And um, that's essentially what I'm trying to uh, convey here in terms of parallelism. Now, there is other ways that you can do this. And one of the, the ways that you could do it is to use max degree of parallelism is equal to one with the option here like this, option max dot one. And what this would do is that even if I didn't have any indexes, it would continue to use just one CPU. However, as a result of this query hint, what happens is SQL Server bypasses its normal optimizer behavior and uh, it sticks to just using the one CPU. And while doing that, naturally the execution time of the procedure would also increase. So what I trade off in terms of CPU utilization would only result in increased query execution time, which was not what I was looking for. I wanted low CPU utilization as well as better or comparable performance in terms of execution as well. So having said that, let's go ahead and run these queries again. So you'll, you'd remember that earlier when I ran this, it was maxed out to 100% uh, my CPU. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and run this. I'm going to run this this one as well and I'm gonna add an extra one now and now you'll notice that when I run my task manager you'll see that the execution is not maxed out at hundred percent even after having all these queries running in parallel in fact I have an additional batch running now I still end up with CPU utilization that's significantly lower compared to uh, what it was earlier and uh, the best way to kind of identify that is by looking at the waiting tasks so you'll see here that the waiting task at this moment, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, 
uh, CPU related weight tasks anymore and you'll see that at this moment the CX packets which was earlier the biggest weight type that I had or one of the two biggest weight types I had is no longer really the biggest weight type that I have also you'll notice that uh, the count in terms of uh, scheduler OS yield is significantly lower than it was before and again a synchronous network IO is basically just the amount of time that it takes to go ahead and display the results here in these grids so by doing this particular kind of indexing behavior that I've just shown you what we are able to achieve is we're able to reduce the CPU utilization of the CPU of the of the machine and control not just the amount of weight tasks or the waiting count that we have here but just overall be able to run much more larger volumes of, um, of the same query against the same hardware same everything without really affecting any kind of query design or changing the query in any way and uh, that's kind of uh, a crash course if you will in terms of how indexes can be used to improve CPU utilization naturally I will elaborate on some other things like worker thread count etc in future videos but I guess this should be a great starting place for novices who are trying to understand how indexes can play a role in CPU utilization as well as other performance tuning aspects I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching.